Thank you for waiting and welcome to Sydney Rediscovered, a Metropolis of Five Cities online event. My name is Erica and I will be assisting in today's online event. Please note you will be on mute throughout the event and there will be the opportunity to submit any questions that you have through the question and answer function on the bottom of your screen. These will be addressed at the appropriate time. I would now like to introduce your event host and MC for today, award-winning journalist and co-host of ABC TV's The Drum, Ellen Fanning. Please go ahead, Ellen. Thanks so much, Erica, and welcome to everybody uh, joining us online for this virtual event this morning. Sydney Rediscovered, a metropolis of five cities hosted by Georges River Council in partnership with the Committee for Sydney, Wollongong City Council and Business Western Sydney. Now, before I welcome Georges River Mayor, Kevin Green, we'd like to begin today with a recorded welcome to country from Brendan Kerrin, an elder with the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Lands Council. Hello everyone, my name is Brendan Kerrin. I'm a cultural representative of Metropolitan Aboriginal Land Council in Redfern. And my role as cultural representative is to perform walk the country and smoking ceremonies. Our role as a land council, Aboriginal land council, is more or less to make sure um, whatever's done within the lands of um, Metropolitan is done uh, culturally respectfully and culturally appropriate um, and, and in a relationship. But I'm here today to, to welcome uh, everyone to country. I'm currently situated on the lands of the Bodago people. Uh, they are one of 29 clans which make up the Eora Nation. And the boundaries for the Eora Nation start from Sydney Harbour in the ocean. And uh, the boundaries are surrounded by three of the world's most beautiful rivers the Hawkesbury River, the Nepean River, and the Georges River. And in between those three mighty rivers, we have 29 clans, language groups, which make up the Eora Nation. And the name of the clan that I'm situated on today is the Bidjigal people. So on behalf of myself, on behalf of Metropolitan Aboriginal Land Council, I'd like to welcome everyone here today. For me, a welcome to country is, I'm always honoured to perform a welcome to country. Ten years ago, we would never have had as Aboriginal people the opportunity to perform a welcome to country or an acknowledgement of country. And I know for a fact that ten years ago, you would never have had a welcome to country performed by such a good looking bloke as myself. So once again, welcome. Thank you for that warm and generous welcome, Brendan. Wonderful words from which to begin and wonderful to see uh, the traditional lands, uh, the thousand year old, millennial aged lands uh, that your people have been on and to be on those today and to be discussing today the future for our shared communities across those lands. Uh, next to the Mayor of George's River Council, Kevin Green was a member of the New South Wales Parliament from 1999 to 2011, representing first George's River, then Oatley. And during that time, he had a number of ministerial roles, Minister for Gaming, Racing, Sports, Minister for Major Events. He was first elected to George's River Council in September 2017. Uh, he was also elected as George's River uh, Council's inaugural mayor, and he has lived in that area since 1965, which for folks like us, Mayor Green was just the other day. Good morning to you. Good morning, Ellen, and uh, thank you for that welcome. And also a big thank you to Brendan for his welcome to country. Like Brendan, I am also sitting uh, in the lands of the Bidigal people, and uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to pay my respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Well, Ellen, thank you. And also a big thanks to all our distinguished guests and the VIPs who are are sharing in today's webinar. Uh, to those who are making uh, appearances as guest speakers and contributing, uh, we certainly offer our thanks to you. And of course, we also recognise our partners in this event, the Wollongong City Council, uh, Business Western Sydney, City of Newcastle, and of course, the Committee for Sydney. 
and we thank each of you uh, for your enthusiastic participation. Today is about the future and prosperity of Greater Sydney and acknowledging that the South District and other regions such as Wollongong, Newcastle and the Central Coast have a huge part to play in reinforcing that growth. Over the past 20 years, the growth of Greater Sydney has been predominantly focused in the North and the East West. Sydney's global economic corridor, an area considered to drive the city's global economy, arcs from Macquarie Park through the CBD and stops at Sydney Airport. These locations have developed as major employment and activity centres and have been the focus of significant investment in infrastructure. Further, the vision and long-term plans for the Western Aerotropolis around the future airport at Badgeries Creek has ensured future jobs growth and economic prosperity in Western Sydney. However, it should be noted that the South not only has a great deal to offer wider Sydney, but can also support all Sydney districts to work together to achieve a better, fairer and more connected city. With our escalating climate crisis and with the ongoing pandemic, there has never been a more urgent time to work together and support each other in building more sustainable, livability and productivity opportunities in Sydney. That is why today is so important, as we bring together leading city shapers to reflect on the three cities model of Greater Sydney and to identify opportunities that the South and other regions have to offer in supporting the future success of Sydney. To give you a glimpse of what those opportunities could be, specifically for the Georges River area, I would like to introduce you to Georges River, Sydney's connected community. Our location, environment and economy make Georges River a place of undiscovered potential. With proximity and easy access to the Sydney CBD, Sydney Airport and Port Botany, as well as our two strategic centres, the bustling and energetic Hurstville and the thriving health, knowledge and wellness precinct at Cogra, Georges River is ready for you to discover, visit and invest. We sit at the centre of the undiscovered south of Greater Sydney with significant opportunities for investment, economic and employment growth. The potential of our strategic centres Cogra and Hurstville and our villages will be achieved through investment in city shaping infrastructure. This will increase productivity, access to high quality jobs and support the New South Wales Government's vision for a Sydney as a 30 minute city. Georges River and the South District has six strategic centres, a strong TAFE network and a growing university presence, a world-class health and education precinct, thriving industrial areas, entertainment and cultural assets, and most of all, a population of highly educated, ambitious and inspiring people. Vital to the future of Georges River is the River Rail, a proposed 24 kilometre rail link connecting the people of Georges River to Parramatta via Bankstown, transforming Sydney and helping to realise the potential of the South District. This will grow gross regional product by an additional $7.5 billion and provide access to an additional 100,000 jobs by 2045. The livability, sustainability and productivity of Georges River will create a thriving South District and a stronger Sydney. It's time to discover, visit and invest in Georges River. And a warm, well, a very big thank you there to Mayor Green. And the, for the video, a wonderful glimpse at the uh, ambitions for your community. Well, as uh, he was saying, today is an opportunity to take a broader look at the growth of Greater Sydney. Uh, really in the context of COVID-19 and the work from home revolution in part, as, long as, the, as well as the growing issue of climate change affecting where we live and how we work. Now, a big theme today will be whether these seismic changes we've seen 
I got to prompt city planners and elected officials to start working collaboratively or increasingly collaboratively to address the sort of jobs deficit um, that exists in the places that so many of us live and what all of their planning and dreaming might mean for how we invest in our future. As the title suggests, uh, as Mayor Green said, it's perhaps time to think about Sydney, not as a metropolis of three cities, East and Central, Western, but as five cities, uh, acknowledging both the opportunity for the Southern airtropolis around Mascot Airport, as well as the role that the regions can play. So with that in mind, we've brought together a range of thinkers today, thinkers and speakers to make the case for the future. Uh, we're gonna to start today with an update from Peter Poulet, uh, the Central City District Commissioner, uh, Greater Sydney Commission. Uh, then we're gonna hear a keynote address from Dr. Tim Williams. We're gonna take a break and then there'll be an opportunity to hear from a range of panelists representing the Illawarra, the Newcastle region, the Great George's River and the mighty West of Sydney to, to revisit this idea of the sandstone mega region uh, the role of gateway cities and livability centres and what we might have overlooked in our Sydney-wide planning uh, that is now clear to us post-pandemic. Um, all the way along, uh, as Erica said at the beginning, we'd really like to encourage you to use the Q&A function uh, to send in your comments and your suggestions and ideas, really to build up uh, an interactive uh, brainstorming uh, vibe to what we're trying to achieve today because when we get to our panel discussion uh, later in the day we're going to weave those comments through we're going to really be able to assess everything that has been said by our panelists by our three chosen provocateurs as we've called them not due to their personalities but due to the role that they will play today in presenting pointed questions to our panel but also your questions and ideas that you have presented throughout on the Q&A function. So let's start with uh, Peter Poulet. Again, Central Sydney and South District Commissioner with the Greater Sydney Commission. He was the New South Wales Government Architect for many years. He won the Sulman Award for Public Architecture at the New South Wales Architecture Awards in 2020 and is a Life Fellow of the Australian Institute of Architects. Good morning, Peter. Ah, good morning, Ellen. Thank you very much and good morning to everybody online. Um, a significant discussion, I believe, uh, is to be held today. Opportunities for our districts, our regions, particularly of the South and, and the, the Centre, uh, in supporting the future success of Greater Sydney. And firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and future. And I extend that respect to all First Nations people present online today. So welcome and thank you. If I may have my next slide, I'm not, I'm not the driver today. Um, I believe Erica is. <laughs> um, but let's start where we, uh, from the beginning, I guess, uh, the metropolis of three cities, Mayor Green spoke to that earlier. The 2018 region plan, it seems so long ago, reimagined Greater Sydney um, and then let's discuss how to advance this plan to contemplate the five cities that have been mentioned. Um, the region plan that was released in 2018 had as its central concept, the metropolis of three cities and the 30 minute city, aimed to boost equity and opportunity across all of Sydney. And I think that still holds true today. Uh, three cities would bring jobs closer to where people lived, more businesses and industry would be located west and thus balance the metropolis. New universities, schools would be established closer to where the students are and the services and amenities of life would be within easy 30 minutes reach of where, of where people lived. Now, that work continues. The vision became New South Wales government policy in March, 2018. And now it's really the cornerstone of the planning uh, connecting growth transport and infrastructure that we're undertaking. In fact, the multi-city model that that started, that thinking, uh, is more real and more sensible post-pandemic because the policy centricity is working uh, to our advantage. The pandemic has demonstrated that diversification is a critical urban strength uh, and that needs to be actively planned for and encouraged. Across the world, and I'll talk to this later, 
the shapes and sizes of cities have uh, and how they connect with each other has changed. We're seeing a shift from individual cities to a series of connected places. And these connected centers enjoy the new geographic freedoms provided by digitalization, as well as the positive effects of large numbers of people and assets in the same place. We've seen widespread government endorsement and, and adoption of the three city principle. Um, we've also had community endorsement. The majority of Sydney siders agree that the metropolis of three cities is a good idea appropriate to focus development in the centre and west in the first instance to redress some of the imbalances that have been there. And the global research that we released in October, and some of you might have been present on that webinar, uh, confirms the growing global recognition that the dynamic uh, and resilient cities of the future will be polycentric. The disruptions and accelerations brought on by the pandemic uh, include new ways of working, um, have really given us opportunities uh, as, made, as much as made our lives difficult for a little while. And it's an opportunity to, to reset and rebalance our metropolis. Um, we're a little out of sync with the slides, but that's cool. I'll keep talking. <laughs> um, when we look at the 2018 plan, it's clear the world uh, and Greater Sydney have experienced unforeseen levels of change. So how our cities function, shift, uh, we can't imagine, couldn't have imagined a few years ago. Um, and they've had big city shaping impacts or potential impacts. Back in 2018, the big issues we saw then, population growth, transport, strength of increasingly diverse communities, digital cities, um, housing and land use, uh, were, all, were all top of mind. But after the pandemic, the floods, the fires, the mouse plague, if you wanna go that far, um, we've repositioned and reprioritized our challenges and our opportunities. Housing affordability and affordable housing remain critical issues, but the social and environmental aspects of city planning are now front and center in a way they weren't necessarily in 2018. Hybrid working uh, wasn't a thing. Transport and logistics are very different now. The way we move people and things around the city have changed, all those I hope you're buying your Christmas presents now because you're going to miss out on it. All of this is a significant uh, when we consider the CBDs and our local centres in the future. And all of this is feeding into our review of our plans um, and our work overall. And we're, we're working with the council to do that. Um, the review of the uh, region plan is supposed to occur by 2023. So a five year check that the government has legislated for us. Um, that's about two slides ahead, but that's okay. Um, many of the principles of the 2018 plan stand, but we have to ensure the plan evolves to meet the new challenges we're facing and ensure its relevance post pandemic. Um, that's the work we're undertake, undertaking now. So we're engaging with people, we're doing some research and not to make, really to make sure that our region wide strategic planning is in place to support a greater Sydney uh, post COVID. Um, next steps, we release a consultation piece mid-year posing some questions. How have other cities adapted post COVID-19? How does greater Sydney adapt to net zero? Very important and, and current. How do we manage lands uh, as, the, as the nature of industry, manufacturing, retail has evolved? What are the future jobs and how do we need to plan for them? How can we plan for better social cohesion? And we saw some of that uh, tension during the uh, recent lockdown. How will our CBDs change? How will our local centres change? How will they play a greater role? How will they serve our communities better? Um, how will they be better, more pleasant places to be in? How do we manage heat, urban heat? And of course, how do we manage the challenges of housing affordability? All this, is informing our work. So, and we're on the right slide now. Thanks, Erica. Um, we're also uh, conducting some global research um, with the UK-based urban consultancy, Business of Cities. Um, we wanted to understand how other cities are repositioning and preparing for post-pandemic life. Um, and you can see the cities that participated in, in that research um, on the map there. Um, so here's the headline, cities aren't dying, 
Uh, without exception, all cities interviewed are planning for vibrancy and growth to refer, return post pandemic. But, and this is important, they are not planning to return to how it was pre COVID. Overall, cities across the world are resetting and taking advantage of the disru disruptions and the accelerations that have occurred, uh, particularly the digital one. Uh, and we also have the chance to reset and rebalance Sydney. This is a major opportunity. Um, some of the things we need to be thinking about as we refresh the plans. Housing is essential, but it's part of a bigger story. Housing plus jobs plus transit uh, nodes um, equals a flourishing and equitable city or more equitable city. We need to prioritize jobs and housing around those transport nodes. Density doesn't mean to, uh, we need to sacrifice livability so we can make much better use of the spaces and the buildings um, to make sure that the public are happy and have access to public space and services. Um, a concerted effort to use those spaces better. Uh, and digital connectivity, can't live without it now. This is for uh, reasons of equity as much as anything else and Sydney's economic success. To be competitive and survive uh, similar sh shocks as the pandemic, um, we, we need to enable a hybrid city. So the way we're gonna live and work is the hybrid model. There are exciting opportunities to use the digital acceleration to serve both economic and social goals. Availability of high-speed broadband is now an essential uh, that we can't live without. We must address the digital divide to ensure equal access to all services. Next slide, please. Um, so some more of the key findings. Cities aren't dead, but they're changing. All evidence suggests that CBDs will remain vital places of creativity, collaboration, innovation, and human connection. The pandemic may have accelerated the trend towards remote working, digital technology ad adoption, and new patterns of mobility. But as the crisis recedes, the shift in the economics, composition, and character of CBDs should be gradual and not too disruptive. Major shifts uh, for centres are likely to be for example, declines of office space demand or in office space demand, and the future metropolis as a platform for innovation and new industries, a likely transition from finance to tech sectors, changes to retail offerings and office space, and the shift to, as I said earlier, the hybrid city. We've seen changes happening faster than ever before. Driven by the urgency to act, governments are less risk adverse and more accepting of major policy shifts and changes. So this leads to an opportunity, and what's great is we're grabbing it here today. Um, so a global competition for talent between cities is, is re-emerging, and talent moving to where it can find other talent and compelling environments, and we've got that in Sydney. Um, and I hate to use this term, but brand will be critical, as, as will knowing what your city stands for, for having a strong innovation culture, but also still including those things such as tourism, culture, leisure, essential for people's well-being. These are all essential ingredients. Next slide, please. Um, so what is it? This means that the nature of our urban economy, where it's located, will fundamentally shift. Post-COVID, we have a we have a planning. Um, we're planning for a knowledge economy alongside a concerted push for greater Sydney-wide economic planning. Globally, the pandemic has rebalanced economic activities in many cities between the central CBD and suburban C CBDs and local centres and even beyond to the wider region. This trend is set to continue uh, as businesses seek proximity to customers and more people working closer to home. I imagine that uh, post-pandemic, most large firms could relinquish a slice of their city office presence in favour of suburban satellites closer to where their workers live. For example, Amazon is placing thousands of new jobs in the smallest, uh, in the smaller city of Bell Bellevue across the lake from its headquarters in Seattle. One challenge ahead of us will be to boost secondary centres without taking away from the main CBDs. So places like Hurstville, places like Cogra are essential to the, to the future of Sydney's success. Today, uh, we're talking about a metropolis of five cities. Amsterdam aims to create nine secondary cities 
uh, city centres uh, around its CBD by 2050. Vancouver has been challenged for market share by Surrey and Burnaby, as well as third tier Langley and Maple Ridge. So this reinforces how critical it is to think about Sydney's relationship with the broader region. For example, Cascadia, the Cascadia mega region is envisaged um, that Portland, Seattle, Vancouver becomes, becomes one. The cities may maintain their separate identities and that's important for Wollongong and for Newcastle. Uh, and the stories that they tell uh, will be different, but they do play into the, the larger collaboration, both in government and business. The project will evolve. Um, the project will involve creating mixed use developments and high density housing adjacent to high speed rail. We need to think about the relationship with Wollongong, Newcastle, Central Coast, as mentioned by the Mayor, but equally Bathurst, Goulburn, even Canberra. We might move Canberra to Western Sydney. Yeah? <laughs> um, uh, city land use uh, is becoming more and more complex and we're, we're reviewing industrial lands as, as we speak at the Commission. A simple place to work and a place to live, those binaries don't, don't hold any longer. Industrial lands remain vital and they must meet the needs of our citizens and, and the challenging economy, but we must plan for their evolution and change uh, and better use. Planning policy will need to be continually revisited to ensure this happens. We must proactively integrate technology into our planning to best enable a sustainable and equitable city. Next slide, please. And how we talk to ourselves needs to shift uh, a strong collective narrative and, and purpose. Uh, joining up economic and city planning will need government and business to work together and innovate on new models, new stories, um, and new communities. We need the Sydney story to be honest, comprehensive, and about all of us, the whole city region. And we, <laughs> and we are much older than all this. Um, as, we, as the Welcome to Country tells us, Sydney is both an ancient and a contemporary place. We have more than 70,000 years of continuous culture here, land management, wisdom from our first peoples. Our citywide narrative has to embrace our Aboriginal heart as well as our diverse peoples and show how our city can work for all of its residents. Um, we're yet to, to achieve that, but we're talking about it finally. We need to focus on what makes us unique and makes us stand out and makes us special and how our connected cities together make a thriving global metropolis. Last slide, please. Ellen, thanks. People can contact me and the commission and we're available. We're out there to do the right thing. So I think it's important that we are part of this conversation and I thank everybody for including us. And I'm, I'm interested to be provoked later. Ellen, you're mute. Ellen, you're just on mute. That is a rookie error this far into the pandemic. Uh, thank Ooh. you, Peter. What a wonderful, um, inspiring uh, look at our sense of place and how our sense of place has shifted over the course of the pandemic and really how other global centres are thinking about, uh, are thinking about this. The example of Portland, Seattle and Vancouver um, is a, just a terrific uh, example and really very relevant to what we're talking about. And your final comments around how we talk to ourselves, the collective narrative we tell, um, I think is absolutely vital. What uh, we've been living in the present day after day after day since about January 2020 and how we talk to ourselves at events like this and generally about what we want to, the future to look like and how we want to dream and live and exist uh, on these ancient lands, I think is really important. So I'm really think, looking forward to the conversations face to face, Ellen. I'm so sick of Zoom. Yes. <laughs> it doesn't work well when we're trying to actually be nuanced. Uh, so I tend to um, prefer a, a personalized conversation. Tim will tell you that. And he's absolutely. up next. Absolutely. But I've got a small black dog behind me who's riveted. So <laughs> here we go. Tim Williams, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, our second speaker for the day and our keynote address. Um, and I think it's fair to say, oh. um, Tim, that um, there are times in the life of a city when the planet, the, you know, the planet's aligned for urban renewal and for a refocused and sharply focused urban strategy. 
Uh, Dr Tim Williams has advised governments and private sector leaders in the UK and in Australia and had an influence on major land use and transport integration projects, including the 2012 London Olympics, Docklands Light Rail and Crossrail in the UK, as well as Light Rail and Sydney Metro closer to home. He was the CEO uh, for the Committee of Sydney uh, for many years, um, a very influential urban policy think tank. And he's long been uh, a champion of this concept of the sandstone region and stronger links, Newcastle, Sydney, Wollongong. Good morning to you, Tim. Hello, and thank you very much for that, Ellen. I'm going to put my slides up now, if I can uh, do that uh, gracefully. Um, and I'm going to do that, I think. Can you see that? Yes, Tim, that looks great. Okay, thank you. I'm going to uh, talk for a little while uh, around this uh, these themes here. Um, and I think... Uh, if I can just manage to do this. Right, thank you. Um, uh, everything that Peter said, I uh, all the above. Um, and I, I think what it, the logic of it, though, is that we need a, an even more dynamic southern strategy within the GSC overall approach and the, and the Department of Planning and New South Wales government. So I'm going to talk about uh, ramping it up, the, the southern strategy within that. I also want to thank Brendan for his very thoughtful welcome to country uh, and um, uh, and indeed his celebration of his looks, which is well deserved. So I think that's uh, very important. I also wanted to thank the the mayor of George's River, uh, but also the fact that we've got um, representation from Wollongong and from uh, the Hunter is fantastic and speaks to uh, a thing I'm very very keen about myself, which is uh, local government leadership. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'd like to thank Peter as well for uh, and the GSC. Uh, for their work and Peter is one of the, the great collaborators of the GSC and I think that's great. So um, I love the title, Sydney Rediscovered. I also uh, uh, wanted to say that I think it's a great event because of the leadership that councils are showing. Um, I'm a lifelong fan, fan of such leadership and I think um, you know they do more than deliver good services. People sometimes forget that. They are place makers and place leaders and they manage upwards, sideways and downwards to get the best not just for their area, but to contribute to the region. And I think we're seeing it at its best today. And they can shape and reshape cities, but indeed also state governments. And I think state governments welcome that sometimes. So it's a great time to have the dialogue. I love the title, uh, Rediscover, because I think sometimes, I think there is a already forming uh, a metropolis of five cities. And I love the word rediscovery because sometimes things are hidden in plain sight. You don't have to invent them all the time. You just need to sort of fall over them. And I think... The fact that we've got this great opportunity on the doorstep of global Sydney is uh, fantastic. Sometimes planners wrongly think that the best projects are always on the horizon, but they're often in, in the neighbourhood near you. I think COVID has helped us see this, uh, as, as Peter just said. Um, so I think rediscovering and I think also reconceiving uh, the plan for Sydney. Uh, we have an emerging city region on the doorstep of Australia's global city. I think it can only grow in economic importance. I think we also need to properly conceptualize our city because when we do so, we'll realize, and it's not just a, a satirical proposition, we actually have a, a second aerotropolis, one that already exists on our doorstep and we need to leverage that, it seems to us. Um, I have previous, as they say in the law courts, uh, on these matters. I helped develop the Committee of Sydney's Western strategy, but also in 2017, in our response to the GSC's Metro Three Cities, we actually did say, and you can look it up, Surely you mean five cities, because we already were clear, partly because we were actually working with the business of cities back in 2016, 2017, that the emerging city region that Sydney should plan for included Newcastle, the Central Coast and the Illawarra. So this is a very timely and I think absolutely correct discussion. I think it's been even more galvanized by the COVID moment. Um, and just to nail it, this is actually uh, a map that comes out of the, uh, not just the GSC plan in 20. 17 but the transport for new south wales and we commended them at the time as a committee we said that there were there's an emerging three cities but the best way to think of our emerging city region is one of five cities we said it there and then i'd like this quote we need to start thinking about how to integrate and capitalize on this extended conurbation and how to better link it with faster mass transit that was true then it's even truer now and i think i'm going to go try and justify that in what follows i also think this 
um, that, you know, uh, cities are best when there's a diversity of strategies. We heard from Peter that polycentricity is a good strength, but it isn't just three cities. The strategy must now include a greater emphasis on the five and not as we see put all our eggs in, in one basket. I think that's diversity in action. Um, so I think uh, this, this time is pretty extraordinary. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the COVID uh, catalysts, if you like, we've heard some of them. It is different this time and the old normal, however much I love it, it's not returning fully. And as Kane said, when the facts change, I change my mind, what do you do? So I'm, I'm urging the Greater Sydney Commission and DPI to think even more deeply about what's changed. Um, and I think also the, um, it's obviously timely because the GSE review, which will be shaped by the COVID uh, moments as we've seen, but I think it also should reflect on what's worked and what's not worked uh, in, as well in the current strategy. So it's a great time to do so. And I think one thing we learn from the international cities discussion we heard about is that people will be, there are changed opportunities and realities and people will be looking for human scale, livable, green, walkable, amenity rich hy hybrid. They, they're gonna live in a world in which they want their nearby hood to have a lot more offer, but they really will be looking for the public health driven city and the green city. And I'm gonna come back to that because I think we have a tremendous offer in the Southern corridor of the kinds of environments that I think people will be looking for more than perhaps the existing GSC strategy in business years. Um, so it's not just about bouncing back, what I'm gonna talk about, it's about bouncing forward, new trends, new market preferences that I've just highlighted, where people will wanna live, where people will wanna invest. We've heard from Peter, it's gonna be a more hybrid world, a more decentralized economic activity going on, I think. Um, but I think that, that whole issue of cities that will be, and places that will be driven by public health and climate management, I think that will be at the heart of future urban planning and not just buildings, but, but places that lend themselves to having a great climate, if you like. I think the opportunity, therefore, the north-south axis, not just the east-west east axis, needs to be seed, seized and reflected in government thinking, planning, investment. I think also, and I'm going to say a little bit about this, the great thing about the existing uh, Aerotropolis area, and I feel like in the southern corridor, is that a lot of public spend has already gone into it. And surely the strategy should be to leverage that as much as possible. And we also see the private sector is hugely responding to the opportunity in the Southern Corridor. This is the public sector. We sometimes forget this, <clears throat> that although West Connex has its own uh, um, sort of controversy, it was meant uh, as indeed the, the new announcement of the, of the Sydney Gateway to reinforce the economic attractions uh, around uh, the corridor to the airport. And it was actually, meant to get people from central Sydney to the airport and businesses. So I, I think it's very important not to lose sight of the existing spend and existing infrastructure that is making it even more attractive to do business uh, in and around the airport. That's really worth playing to in the next iteration of the Sydney strategy, it seems to me. And then al although all airports have faced existential crises, and I'm sure that the second airport in Western Sydney will be affected by that, the evolution of that will be. This has already happened uh, in, in, in our Southern Corridor version of an Aerotropolis, which is a massive private sector and um, uh, purchased by an Australian super uh, of this land opportunity sold by Qantas. This strikes me as much the future of Sydney uh, as, as what we're seeing in far Western Sydney, but we need to think about it like that. I mean, $802 million spend on a piece of land by the airport shows us what people think is the economic future of the corridor. I just thought we need to understand the private sector, not just the public sector, the private sector thinks this is a priority area going forward. COVID, let's do a bit of that. We heard a, a lot about it. This is the moment 15 months ago when Australian cities like everywhere closed down. One thing we forget, Australian cities are very reliable on population growth. Sydney was growing 1.6% a year, that stopped. So I think Peter's right and the business of cities is right. We're gonna see a reinvention of CBDs, but also the, their interrelationship between the wider city region. We've seen some of this return, but I'm calling this the 75% city. This is, this is not the old normal. We, I don't think we're gonna see 100% return mass transit offices. It's gonna be the 75% city. So where would the 25% go? It's a good question. By the way, how do these people get into the game? They didn't cycle there, although it's great that we're seeing more of this. In reality, we're also seeing more of this. There has been a massive return to the car post-COVID. 
So we're, gonna, we're seeing congestion levels we haven't seen for a long while. And I think this in itself will actually bring some decisions to people to move their locational uh, choices away from cities that do this. So I think that's an interesting sort of opportunity of threat at the same time as it were. And I like to show in this because it reminds us that all prognostications about the future are dangerous. This is Manhattan on the left and the right, the same street in 1900. If you predicted in 1900 what the, the transport problem in 1913 would be, you'd say too many horses on the road. And actually there were no horses, it was all cars. We didn't see that coming, but also they've got no exhausts. On the right, they're all electric cars in 1913. Sometimes we don't grasp the future that we can. And I think that's another inspiration to us to understand that there are some choices we can make to do great things. This is locked in. This is not as uncertain as the last slide. This is the shift towards online retail and the reinventions of town centers and shopping malls is upon us. Um, and the question is not just about retail, but what, what, what are the jobs of the future and where will they go? And I'm gonna try and say the Southern Corridor as a real offer in this respect. We know this is happening. We don't know the extent of it, but I'm, I'm working on the 75% city that there'll be 25, 30% of people that are gonna be working in a hybrid working environment from this point on, full stop. Where do you think they're gonna go? Will they go to some of the far Western Sydney options or will they perhaps prefer the Southern Corridor? So I, I think we need just to diversify the strategy to think about that attractive option, it seems to me. So how will we do business and where? People are, are arguing about this. Is this dead face to face? I think not, but we'll see a lot more people wanting to do shorter journeys. The, the, the local centers become places we might have a lot more face to face meetings, not just the CBDs. And that's the view of the property council, which is reinvention of CBDs, but also reassertion of local economic centers. It's a very interesting time. So this has come up the agenda. So this is in the 30 minute city. People are now thinking, how do I get a great five or 10 minute city that I can walk to or, or, or cycle to or drive to actually quite close by? This is another great new opportunity for the Southern Corridor and its key places, it seems to me. People are talking about, it's a phrase I came up with, but it's superb. Are we gonna see uh, a, new, a more sustainable suburbia, a more mixed use with jobs in local centers? Yes, but polycentricity means back the Southern Corridor, not just the existing strategy, it seems to me. So I think this is gonna happen, crudely put. We say, we'll see a kind of shrinkage, but not disappearance of the CBD. It's gonna be that 75, 80%, but there will be an opportunity to have a, a slightly more hub and spokes approach to our city region. And that is not just the outer suburbs, that is towns and cities that are quite well connected to the central city. And I think that's the, the city region of Newcastle, Sydney and Wollongong. I also like this that was in the business of cities document, by the way, it's a great idea that we should now be talking about greater, greater Sydney. Um, and I like the phrase, uh, Sydney's effective scale is starting to extend beyond the established notion of the current metropolis. More of Sydney's patterns of work, life and recreation will take place over a larger geography, the greater, greater Sydney. And I think that's correct. Um, th this comes out of the Business of Cities report for the GSC, but look at it, unlocking new locations, blended region, well-being and resilience. Where will well-being resilience be provided to peoples and to businesses? And I'm looking at the Southern Corridor as more attractive than before even. COVID took us by surprise. This is the GSC work done by Business of Cities. We know this. Um, and there'll be more economic centers, diversity coming out of it. We know that. That emphasis on livability, walkability, and access to green spaces becomes more important going forward. Uh, and I think that needs to make people uh, think about where in Sydney, where in the city region, can we more easily develop livability, walkability, and access to green spaces? And maybe the strategy needs a bit more emphasis on the Southern Corridor. So I think this, so I'm finishing about five minutes. The, what have we stopped doing? This is a great series of questions. I kind of urge DPI, government, GSC to think through this. This came out of a city council in England. What have we, to its staff, what have we stopped doing that we should remain stopped? What have we stopped doing that we should bring back? What have we started doing that we need to stop? What have we started doing that we should continue to do? And my favorite, what are we not doing now that we've never done before, but we might need? One or all those questions, but I think they all lead to a moment of thought about whether the Southern strategy, the Southern corridor really is this kind of place where we have got this new opportunity. They call it the Overton window where previously radical ideas become far more acceptable. The Overton window closes 
quite quickly. I think we should grasp, jump through it, and expand the emphasis of government policy on the Southern Corridor, reminding us, as I go to the end, that uh, we're talking about what, what was an existing economic arc, that it, didn't, it doesn't matter what the shifts in policy tried to get us to do, we must not ignore the reality of the global economic arc, which was down to the airport and has been having ripple effects southward and can be leveraged even more. It's a real economic uh, fact that must not be underemphasized in policy. The GSC itself also says there's a hell of a lot already going on uh, in the GSC collaboration areas inside the George's River Council area alone. But also, if you look at the list of things going on in the Southern District, it's pretty impressive in itself. And this is from the GSC, close to Sydney Airport, Pope Botany, Anstow, Bankstow Airport, a massive amount of potential that I, we think, and I think, needs a bit more strategy, more governance, collaboration, the, the, the councils have shown the way, can we get more involvement, coordination from, from state government around the opportunity? I mean, look, this is, you know, um, uh, these are all to be exploited, and, and I argue that there's an, a kind of an existing aerotropolis already in place, let's leverage it properly, fully, for the benefit of Sydney, but also Newcastle and Wollongong. And also we, we understate the potential, we heard it from Peter, Cogger and Bankstown coming forward in this strategy. They are ideal post COVID kind of town centers in this more decentralized economic world, it seems to us. I also thought this was kind of cheeky, but true to think about physical connections and how close Cogger is to the CBD of Sydney. Parramatta is further away. Badgerys Creek is a long way away. Cogra to Sydney Airport is only 6.9 kilometres. Badgerys Creek to Penrith is actually 21. But I like this Bankstown thing. Bankstown is much closer to the Sydney Aerotropolis than it is to the Badgerys Creek Aerotropolis. So, you know, it's not either or. It's diversifying our strategy to incorporate that reality, it seems to me. Uh, and I've said before, the private sector is on the case, big time. So, a couple of thoughts to conclude about where next. Um, it seems to me that, that we need to think about the, the capacity for growth north of Sydney, south of Sydney, rather than just west of Sydney, it seems to me. There's only moderate growth envisaged for these corridors, um, and yet they have, I think, existing better transport networks, we could improve them. There are more centres already in place, more amenities, more benign climate, I'm going to come, back, come, come to that, uh, but tremendous opportunity for growth, but quite unambitious growth projections. I'll give you an example. The Illawarra growth projections are about 0.8% a year. They could probably be double that. Um, and we need to think about whether we need to recalibrate these growth strategies for these regional areas post-COVID, it seems to me. Um, we also need to think of, and the government is looking at faster rail, uh, to try and shrink the space and make this more of a city region. And obviously, I'm sure everybody in the room and listening is very strong supporters of that. And I was involved with the city council with George's River on this great idea of creating a new rail link. So not just the big city shaping from between cities, but this within city creation of a new corridor to Parramatta, um, but also developing the kind of not just a, a north-south axis, but a central city axis. Very important. I, I'd love Peter to back that. It's in the Transport for New South Wales strategy, but it needs to be speeded up. This is so important we get this one and have a look at why. So that the red area is the area of relative disadvantage. So we've got that at the heart of our city. That's the corridor between uh, Cogra, Bankstown and uh, Parramatta. Don't you want to do something about that? And I think we'd, we'd love for the new iteration of the GSC strategy to take on board these kinds of projects, this kind of thinking about the potential of this area and the coordinated response it now needs. Um, and I think this post-COVID climate thinking um, and, and again, I think, you know, look, this is from the GSC Business of Cities report, but essentially says that long term planning that confronts the climate emergency. So a large minority of the city regions, uh, green is now the guiding principle about where development should take place, not just what it is, but where it is. And I'm sort of arguing that that kind of lens might make you think a bit more about South, uh, about South Sydney. Um, and this is just to finish the it is thought provoking this, um, that, the, that, the, that the, there are 67 days uh, beyond 35 degrees in, in, in Richmond at this point in time, 59 in Penrith. It's a lot cooler on the eastern side. Now, there are great ideas for mitigating, and I, I completely buy into this, the, the heat uh, um, challenge of, of, of far western Sydney, but it is a challenge. And I don't think we should lose sight of 
some of the amenity advantages of the existing areas that might actually be easy to work with. Um, this is just the famous day when Jordan Springs hit 48 degrees in 2019 to remind us of, of some of the challenges. And the last one I think is, is around the, the built environment and transport are really big parts of achieving the net zero universe that we all want to achieve by 2030, 2040, 2050, whatever it is. And so thinking about where we build as well as how we build is an important part of achieving net zero, it seems to me. So I think that's another issue for the GSE to think about. Um, and I love the fact that to end that uh, this is a, a genuinely regional discussion. It's fantastic that Wollongong put this on their website, helping shape greater Sydney. Could there not be a better offer? And I think we need to, as government and private sector to take up the challenge of helping that to happen also with the hunter, Newcastle's present in this discussion. So I think we need to innovate in governance, but also raise our regional ambitions I've said that the Southern Corridor growth, I think, has been a bit underestimated and can be, it can take more. I think the, uh, the, the, the planned rate of growth is a bit under, uh, unmuscular, but I think we need to see the kinds of cross-tier collaboration engagement that we are beginning to see between the councils, but a kind of city deal, Western Sydney type of coordination, which they've done brilliantly uh, working together to come up with a new strategy, a lobbying approach, marketing, and a set of infrastructure investments. I think that kind of approach needs to be replicated in the Southern Corridor. There we are, we see it's been tremendously successful and it's delivering you know, good results. And it would not have happened, I think, without this kind of governance innovation. The GSC is part of it and supports it. We just like a bit of that, I think, applied to the South. Internationally, we see this kind of one corridor working in a place like Toronto, which has got a big regional outside Toronto working together now in this one corridor strategy. I think we need a kind of one corridor approach to the north-south axis that we've been talking about today. And to end, uh, if you think it's a long way from uh, Wollongong to, to Newcastle, it's about the same distance as, as Vancouver to say at Seattle, and they are uh, organizing themselves economically as a corridor and they're beginning to look at shared governance. Um, and so I think this, I'd like to see some conceptual new thinking uh, as the GSC develops its thinking about five cities, uh, not just three, the aerotropolis that's hidden in plain sight. Think hub and spoke city region in the hybrid world. Um, leverage the existing investment of the public sector. I mean, it's like massive in the sub-region, so let's leverage it even more and use it, but also prior prioritize some of the new stuff that we might need in the Southern Corridor. Think post COVID and COVID and climate mitigation in a very creative way about where we develop as much as about how we develop. I think governance, innovation and collaboration, and we should avoid even recent path de dependency because sometimes the old paths are great, but and they shouldn't be forgotten. And we're one of those propositions today. And cheekily, I end with the famous drawing of the New Yorker that was satirizing itself to say how obsessed the New Yorker magazine was with a tiny part of its own city and actually didn't even know uh, where the rest of America was. I'm not actually saying that this is the Sydney view, but I want us to look at this and think, shall we look at Sydney in, in, a, in a wider way as the city region I've been talking about? Thank you. I'd just like to stop sharing your screen. Thank you so much. And Ellen, if you just pop yourself on talk. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that presentation. Tim, we've got one bit of feedback, which I think is interesting, um, that maybe um, just in a couple of minutes before we have a short scheduled break um, that Peter and Tim might like to address. Uh, we keep talking about growth. Are there any limits to growth that should be observed? It seems that there is still a reliance on population growth. Which is it's an interesting question. one. Can I say something about that first before Peter? Mm. Um, I mean, look, uh, the I know that there's controversies around small Australia and big Australia. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of real Australia middle road, uh, which is happening uh, anyway. We we were growing at about, I mean, faster than the um, European countries. It pretty inevitably, it seems to me, mm -hmm. at about one point six percent a year. There'll be variations of that. That stopped uh, at this point in time, and I don't think it's going to reconvene for about maybe three to five years. And there is a really interesting discussion, by the way, about um, whether we want the model that's based on uh, entirely on migration as a way of getting productivity growth or we do something else. So I don't think it's just a, 
I'm not into the kind of let's stop growth. I'm, I'm saying the growth has more or less stopped in terms of population. So we may need to think a bit more uh, about that. But having said that, do I think growth and productivity and wealth increase is better than the opposite? The answer is yes. Mm. And, and, and Peter, that comes back to the whole challenge of COVID, really, the whole challenge to neoliberalism, uh, really, about how, how we live and how we value things. On what basis do we value things? Um, <clears throat> and I think, you know, that, that question about it's about participation in the workplace, which is part of what this conversation is mm. about. That's how we ensure there's growth. If women don't have to get back to, um, or men get back to uh, children 20 kilometres away in childcare, they can participate more fully. It's about population, if you want to look at economic growth and what do we think about that. Um, and it's about productivity and certainly not <clears throat> 30, 40 kilometres to work. So, Peter, to what extent do you think that growth is the North Star? Just a quick answer. On that. Um, personally, I think there's an equilibrium that's reached almost naturally. And we are still in a growth growth phase, particularly as we're a, a young colonial country. Um, and the opportunity that growth provides is still outweighing the need to cap it. How's that for a summary? I think it's very good. Can I just respond to one thing Ellen said, Ellen, quickly, I promise before we go to break, is the, I think it's a, it's a critical part of the, it's the moment. The moment has arrived where the, in, the inevitable expectation of Sydney growing by 100,000 people a year has stopped. I mean, 100,000 people a year was the growth mm -hmm. of Sydney. It stopped. So it is. it should force really original thinking about what that means and what we do next. And uh, I come from a background where I'm quite interested in, in whether wages rise uh, for working people because of that. So there's an interesting moment of choice that we never thought was going to happen about the model. So that's really interesting. And it, and it is not just about growth, but where growth can, can go. I just want to come back on one thing. I think people have been, uh, are sometimes deluding themselves slightly about home working. There's been, there is a real danger of the regendering of, the, of inequality with women at home. Uh, not, not just like, oh, isn't it wonderful, you know, we can get to our school, but not being in the office where the decisions are made and where seniority is handed out. So I think there's a real issue for me about that. And I think secondly, uh, people are underestimating that if I'm a, a market, talk about neoliberalism, if I'm in, the, I'm in the market at the moment, you know, companies will be thinking not just about decentralising to Coffs Harbour, but to Bangalore. So I think it's really quite important that we, we're not complacent about what's happening and we, we really understand how our cities can work better. But I don't think people should assume that home working is a stable thing. I think this hybrid thing is, is more here to stay and that will involve, I think, real opportunities around not the CBD, uh, but other, other parts of our city. So I think that is a real opportunity, but imagination, new strategies, collaboration, everything mm. we just talked about will be yeah. required. Wonderful. Well, we have time for everyone to go and get a cup of tea for about two minutes. <laughs> pretty, pretty ambitious, unless you've got a zip boiler somewhere near where you are. But uh, stretch your legs if your watch is telling you to stand up and bossing you about like mine is. And we will resume in just a couple of minutes for our panel discussion. Yeah. Well yeah. What about those hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm going to leave and come back in. I'm going to leave and come back in.
All right, I do hope you uh, managed to run out and find a cup of tea. Um, and certainly, uh, despite our virtual forum, we have some wonderful comments coming through on that Q&A function uh, down at the bottom of your screen that you can see. Liz Densley is asking, we need to be mindful of the pressure that growth beyond Greater Sydney post COVID. And she's thinking of Bathurst, Orange, Coffs Harbour, and how we ensure the additional pressure on these communities is managed. Uh, and should that be part of any Metro strategy? And that's um, a great introduction, that sort of idea to the panel discussion that we want to have. Um, I want to introduce our panelists. Each of them will speak for five minutes and they will be prodded and prompted by three carefully chosen individuals we're calling provocateurs, which refers to their role rather than their particular personality traits. Um, and while this is happening, while the provocateurs are speaking, um, I will be watching and waiting for your questions on this Q&A function throughout the Zoom session. So please keep the questions and comments coming. We want this to be fast and interactive and some dazzling ideas to come through, challenging notions to come through and pack them all in as much as we can. So uh, again, your role is to send me questions and comments. My role is to introduce the panellists. We'll listen for about 20 minutes, you and I. Um, we'll begin with David Borger. David is the Executive Director of Business Western Sydney and a member of Placemaking New South Wales Advisory Board. He used to be uh, the Minister, New South Wales Government Minister for Western Sydney, Minister for Housing, Roads, uh, Minister assisting the Minister for Transport Roads in uh, New South Wales Labor Governments. He was also the youngest person at 30 years of age to hold the office of Lord Mayor of Parramatta. Uh, from the mighty Wollongong uh, area, the Executive Director of Business Illawarra, Adam Zarf, is with us. He used to be an advisor to the New South Wales Government uh, and now represents 27,000 businesses uh, that comprise the Illawarra. Uh, so his head is in strategic policy advocacy work for that membership. Gail Connor is the general manager of the Georges River Council. She's had 20 years experience in local and state government. Uh, her passions are managing urban growth, infrastructure and transport. Uh, and she's also held senior executive roles in the New South Wales state planning agencies, including New South Wales Transport and Infrastructure and the Department of Planning. So a great mix of skills and experiences there that Gail brings today. And finally, we're very grateful that Simon Massey has joined us. Uh, he is representing the City of Newcastle's Lord Mayor. Simon is the Economic Strategy and Government Relations Manager at the City of Newcastle. So he plays that important uh, role in terms of managing not only economic strategy, but relations with um, broader governments, including the state governments and his backgrounds in demography uh, and economics. And he was a Churchill Fellow back in 2018. Seems like a long time ago now. So we're gonna hear from each of our four panelists for five minutes each, uh, and we'll stud in some questions if we can as we're going along. So keep those questions coming and we'll start with David Borger. Fantastic, thanks Helen. Uh, look, I think the, the uh, I wanted to congratulate uh, <clears throat> the council for, Putting this together today, it's a it's a fascinating discussion, and I guess uh, you know we represent a lot of organisations in Western Sydney, 115 large organisations, most private sector, but also some public sector organisations. And in the last uh, nine years, the 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 great theme, I guess, behind our advocacy has been how do we shift the needle on jobs in Western Sydney? Because there are hundreds of thousands of people that travel from west to east every day to access work. Now that's, if it's a short commute, that's fine. But if it's a long commute, it really does carve out time from family, from being able to exercise. It's a cost of business. It's not really a great thing. And I guess when the pandemic hit, we thought this is very interesting. Um, you know, cities are very resilient. They're very good at coming back from existential threats. You know, when the um, fire started in, the, uh, in Pudding Lane, the Great Fire of London, the whole city was burnt down in a couple of days. Um, and they came back, you know, people fled to the countryside, but they came back to the city. It didn't, the city didn't come back quite the same though. They didn't really build any more houses of timber. They built them of brick. They widened a few streets, but they tried to change their city so that that wouldn't happen. And I guess, um, you know, city, Sydney was a great city prior to the pandemic, but uh, the, the city wasn't perfect. And, and really it was those hundreds of thousands of people traveling from west to east. And this is something that I think whether it's Western Sydney or whether it's uh, George's River or, or, or other sort of suburbs surrounding Sydney, 
where people can, it's really the barbecue stopper, I think, when you're talking to people, how long does it take you to get to work every day? And the one thing that we have realised in the last two years, I think, is the value of our own time because we've had so much more of it back. Well, not always. Sometimes we're just in Zooms all day and we, we don't have that, that time back. And uh, so we're really interested in, um, we sort of accept all the things Tim says around agglomeration is very important. Uh, but, but if we can have a, a more balanced city by working a day or two from home or possibly from a co-working hub, we think that's something that, that probably should be encouraged. We've seen a, a rise in spending in local centres during the downturn, and we think that uh, you know that's been that's been really good for community. So we hope that the city can can benefit from these changes, and we don't just snap back to exactly where we were because because where we were two years ago wasn't great for everyone. If you're slipping an hour and a half to get into work, an hour and a half to get back, I mean that that can be soul destroying, and doing that for an entire working life can be very very challenging. Uh, you know, we, we, we had a housing engine in the West and a jobs engine in the East, and, and this was an unbalanced kind of place. So um, I think we've learned we can be productive. I, I do agree. With, I mean, we, we need to come together. Teams need to come together. And I think organisations need to show leadership in, in, in saying when that when it happens. Like, we can't just leave it up to everyone. We If we leave it up for everyone, we'll be like ships in the night. We'll, I'll come in one day, Tim will come in the next, and we'll never actually do our collaborations of scheming and plotting, Tim. So... Um, you know, and I guess that that's the view that we've got from uh, Business Western Sydney. I hope that's enough. Did you, do you want me to go on, or is that like use too much time? Uh, no, you have a little more time if you like. I think, in terms, if I may, about um, thinking around the provision uh, of those local hubs that might allow for that hybrid working. Yeah. So one of the things that we thought should happen is the government should show some leadership because, of course, they're the biggest employer. They have the most office workers in uh, both frontline workers but also, uh, you know, big government agencies. They have had some successes in, in decentralising those offices, so they've had experience in doing that. Uh, I, I think the other thing that businesses are sort of interested in is, of course, they want productivity, they want, uh, you know, effective teams and, and, and all of that. Um, they also don't want to spend too much money on their on their offices, and we have a very small constrained CBD in the city of Sydney, and we pay amongst the highest office prices in the world. So, you know, we're we're hoping that, um, that there's kind of a business angle in this as well to look towards, you know, places like George's River in some way, uh, Parramatta or Liverpool, you know, other places in in, in Western Sydney, and, and we think government uh, can can do a little more. So one of these we suggested was that they create uh, touchdown hubs. They might have large public service workforces working in Newcastle or in George's River um, that don't need to come in five days a week. And rather than, you know, government can be very siloed, as we all know. And, you know, in the old days, if you're in government agency A, that was only the workers from that agency. No other workers from any other agency can go there. Well, well I, think, I think we need to turn that around and say that wherever there's a significant government office presence, you know, part of that floor space should be available to any public servant who's got to come in and, and work in an agile sort of way. Um, so they can really lead the way. I guess the second thing we thought was interesting was, uh, you know, the co-working hubs, uh, the, the, the focus tends to be, I mean, I think prior to the pandemic, if you thought about it, you would think of, you know, a hipster living in Piermont with long hair, uh, going down the road, to a to a startup hub with lots of trendy people who, who had new ideas and were trying to start a new business. Nothing wrong with that. That's fantastic. But but we think co-working places can be more than that. And they can they can they can you know talk to the suburbs as well. And the private sector might well be interested in this. We know that retail is challenged, big retail's challenged. they the you know the footprints of the center group and uh, vicinity and so on, they're shrinking. They, they are shrinking. And we, we and we've done more online shopping than we ever thought we ever want to um you know there's there's a uh, we need we need a road upgrade in my street because the amount of boxes that come to our door every day <laughs> um and i just think with that comes an opportunity what will become of all of that uh retail space that's left in those those mega you know uh, regional shopping centers and they're certainly looking at this you know there's a couple in chadston that the big you know mega shop in, in melbourne a couple of co-working hubs i think they're, they're looking for opportunities uh, and we think that some of the private sector might be more interested in a more distributed uh, office environment. You know, the, the shopping centres were getting some inquiries last year to say we want a thousand desks, but we want them everywhere because we think that's what our workforce will want. And I guess just finally, Ellen, um, one of the things that might drive this is actually 
you know, your ability to get talented employees. And mm -hmm. it's very hard for people that live on the edge of Sydney, particularly couples, families with children. There's a, a thing called the, what's it called, the virtual leash, Tim, but, but where... Spatial leash. A spatial leash. That's the, what I was looking for, Alan. <laughs> it kicks uh, in about 90 minutes before the childcare centre closes. Doink! <laughs> exactly. Where, you know, women in particular, I think, are very disadvantaged by those outer Sydney locations. If you're a, if you're a female uh, medical scientist living in Oran Park, good luck because it's going to be very hard for you to actually get to work if, 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 if you're the designated person that stays close to the school in case there's a, there's, there's a challenge. So you know, hopefully companies, in order to attract talent that they haven't thought about, will be more flexible and won't require people to be in for presenteeism, for just to be there you know, every single day with a the coat, coat on. We heard about the, the law firm years ago where people would sort of leave the coat on the on the on the chair, so people thought they were still there at seven o'clock at night because that's what you had to do. You know, hopefully those days are over. Yeah, that's a terrific introduction. Um, I think to you, Adam. If you just unmute, um, you would have heard uh, uh, the comment from Tim about the regular 0.8% uh, population growth in the Illawarra could cheerfully double. Um, what do you think of that idea? I mean, there's positives and negatives that come with that. Yeah, thanks, Ellen. Um, look, I think given the, res uh, the rental vacancy rates here right now in the Illawarra, it's, it feels to many locals like the population already has doubled. And I think we do have the challenge to densify uh, not just the city of Wollongong, not just the CBD of Nowra, but places in between. And so I guess there's active discussions happening with council to look at new land release areas and how I guess we can intensify um, the residential opportunities there. Having said that, uh, Wollongong as a city really is uh, seeing huge residential uh, development. We're seeing, you know, there's, I think at any given point, there's 12 cranes in the sky uh, at the start of the pandemic. And that's also manifesting itself in a significant interest in, in commercial uh, real estate as well. Uh, you know, with I think there's been a 70% increase in uh, the A-grade office stock pipeline uh, since the start of the pandemic. So that's a really good sign, I think, from the point of view that businesses are really looking to Wollongong um, and, and Nowra as well as, uh, as places to locate a business because they can access terrific uh, skilled workers, uh, you know, graduates from the University of Wollongong. That's why we've got so many tech companies um, basing themselves in the region. So look, I think it really is uh, coming ahead in leaps and bounds from both a residential and a commercial uh, market perspective. Mm. And what do you see as the challenges? Because I mean, we're, we're trying to solve a lot of things at once. And I think um, Peter and Tim uh, really gave a great introduction to that. And, and housing affordability is an issue that comes up over and over again. What do you see as the implications for housing affordability for, as Matthew Salomon has asked on the Q&A um, here, uh, density sprawl as a result of the fact that, um, you know, we don't have migrants coming into the moment, at the moment. We've got probably two to three years before that resumes. And so maybe there's a bit more work of power to say, if you won't give me a pay rise, I'm not going to come into the office five days a week. I'm going to live in Wollongong. It's a really interesting perspective, Alan. We did some research on this, but I'll just quickly quickly note, when I took the job that I'm in now four years ago, Tim Williams was the first guest I invited to the region because I wanted and our members wanted to know how we could be a part of this discussion that's happening today on this call. You know, How do we be a part of a sandstone mega region that's connected, that puts residents within an easy reach of each other? Because I think the pandemic showed that we can work remotely part of the time, but I think the end of the pandemic, uh, if hopefully that's what we can call it, is also showing that we want to be together again and we want to travel and we want to, you know, go between Sydney and, and regional New South Wales and, and interact again. So transport linkages are, remain our largest challenge for regions like ours. Uh, we do have an antiquated rail line that was built in the late 1800s up the South <laughs> Coast line. Uh, we don't have that connection that we want to Western Sydney, to Parramatta, to the Aerotropolis and so on. So we share that, I guess, that um, we, we share that with council and, and, and acknowledgement to council as well for putting on a great session today. We share that ambition to have that connection across to the West because that's uh, the hub of the future growth of jobs and industry. Uh, so look, I think infrastructure remains our challenge, but we've had headway recently with, with major roads. 
uh, with the state government. Uh, you know, of course, with um, particularly with the with the sale of 50% of West Connects, you know, the state's looking to invest that back again. So we really support the asset recycling to bring us all closer together by roads. But of course, rail is where we are really looking uh, to see some future leadership. And we always get excited when we see those um, maps thrown up by Tim uh, earlier in the session. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Do that. Do that. Um, Kathy, can I turn to you next? Um, David Zabel has a really interesting point that might um, kick off your comments for us today, your introductory comments. Uh, he says, I think the challenge for places like Cogra is developing a physical identity that draws people in beyond its connection to the airport. The architecture leaves a lot to be desired, a strong and enforceable design guide, high quality and distinctive materials, small subdivision patterns, greater solidity, et cetera, that reflects the local environment and culture needs to be in place. Think the terraces and warehouses of the inner city or the deco apartments of the eastern suburbs. What will define George's River? Gail. Thanks, Ellen. Um, it's an interesting question uh, because George's River has the opportunity opportunity to become many things. We're feeling a, a little bit neglected at the moment as part of the South District um, and our River Rail document and, uh, and I thank you to Adam for um, mentioning the rail connections but we think our River Rail document is our opportunity to promote the South District. As Tim said we already have a Southern Air Atropolis. Um, it's been there for quite a while, it's been recognised in various metro strategies over the years. Um, so to go to your point, uh, Cogra, Hurstville, any part of George's River really doesn't need to be any different from anywhere else in the city. Um, numerous speakers today have talked about the change with COVID and how the way we live and work will forever be changed. I tend to agree with Tim that probably we'll return to about a 75%, maybe 80% mix of people wanting to be back in places and centres. And that's the Georges River Council opportunity to build those places. Our River Rail document says that, uh, you know, about 100,000 more jobs will be accessible along that corridor because we want to create places around stations. Now, they can be terrace housing. They can be, uh, you know, conversion of existing industrial warehouses. They can be anything that we want it to be in the future because we won't be defined by where we need to live and where we need to work. All of these opportunities are now open to us. Uh, Cogra is very close to the southern air metropolis, as uh, Tim pointed out, much closer uh, to the airport than you know, Parramatta is to Badgerys Creek. So there's latent opportunity there for us to invest more in the southern area of the city and you know, create some city shaping infrastructure. I mean, there's lots of uh, challenges to work through before we get there, but today's about discovering how, this, how the South can contribute to a city. And I go back to the 2005 Metropolitan Strategy, the City of Cities, and there's uh, a lot of people on this call that were around in those days, certainly David was and, and Rod Simpson, hi Rod, you know, helped uh, me prepare it as part of a team for the government. And, Surprisingly enough, um, that had a city of five cities and Rodwell would call it well. And those cities were focused on uh, north and south of the CBD and Liverpool and Penrith and Parramatta. But importantly, back then, we were also talking about connections to Newcastle and the Lower Hunter and connections to Wollongong. And it was always, and Tim's nodding furiously, but it was always part of the government strategy 15 years ago uh, to make those connections and, and they could do some more heavy lifting. Those regions could do heavy lifting. Um, and as Adam says, there's no reason why you can't live and work in those regions. There's no reason why the urban form and the urban structure and the building typology can't match those that are, are found in the inner city and CBD areas. There is absolutely nothing stopping councils in those areas uh, from imagining the same sort of sub superbia, Tim, uh, that we already exist in, in those well-connected areas in, in the inner city. Uh, so our vision for River Rail really is around creating jobs. And we're saying, you know, if we build this rail, there'll be around 120,000 people who can walk to a railway station and be within 30 to 45 minutes of their job. Like not, not that does not happen now in, in the Southern district of, of the, the city. You know, we have a very, very low rate of accessibility to public transport. 
it's the lowest in all of the CBD area, which is astounding because we're so close to the airport. But nevertheless, um, our vision for the future is not only connecting Cogra to Parramatta, but we see it connecting through to Wollongong and potentially up through the north to Newcastle as well. So yes, you know, local government is doing some of the heavy lifting and I, and I thank Tim for his comments. Um, we do do more than uh, repair potholes and, and pick up garbage. Uh, we are thought leaders in this space and we do manage upwards, downwards, sideways and backwards sometimes. Okay. Um, because that's the role of councils now, creating those places. And if you start with a piece of investment from the government, such as a railway line, you know, if you build it, the councils will come. We will create the places around those stations. We will, we will create the centres. We will manage them. We will activate them and we will design them. We just need the government to do that heavy lifting at the start and build the infrastructure. So. Meanwhile, Gail, um, John Engler has just suggested Clive James Square, a statue at least, for all the monarchists to gather around. Terrific. Well, we have Clive James Library, Ellen. Right. Uh, the mayor did a mayoral minute um, when he passed and we renamed our library at Cogra the Clive James Library. So there is a, a, a nod to Clive already. But once again, that's a great example of how you don't need to be in a massive city centre, a big CBD, to be able to recognise that each place has its own characteristics that we can celebrate. Now, let me turn to uh, Simon Manassi. Simon, I'll ask you to unmute um, your microphone. I'm very interested to meet you because... Um, the, the demo, I want you to kind of put your demographic hat on, if you will, because demography is destiny. Uh, the Greater Sydney Commission might think that they determine our destiny, but it turns out people will do whatever they want, much like water will run uh, downhill. So what, um, what both Peter and Tim were talking about, um, uh, particularly Tim, was the existing arc, the recognition of what is. And Tim was talking about the ways in which we've recognised that we've changed. Uh, as a result of COVID, um, in some ways to create the sorts of, um, to value the sorts of, of working lives uh, that we wanted to have. Now, I, I would exclude um, uh, essential workers from that who've had to go out regardless, um, whether to deliver packages or to nurse people on the front lines. But um, we heard the private sector case of Australian super paying all that money for a big block of industrial land around the airport. Um, you know, everybody wants to move to Wollongong or Newcastle or Brisbane or Bathurst or Coffs Harbour. Um, to what extent are we waiting for the um, planning to catch up with the demography? Well, thanks very much for the introduction, Ellen, and I uh, really appreciate the leadership from George's River Council for, for leading this discussion today. Love the phrase, demography is destiny, and as a demographer, something that um, I'm really interested in unpacking uh, today, and wanted to introduce a concept uh, called Gateway Cities, and it's a, an alliance that we have uh, partnered and led with, with Wollongong and Geelong initially, but it has a real scope to expand moving forward, and it sort of connects to Tim's point about local government leadership, thinking about long-term strategic planning to uh, address population growth, but also to consider the spatial distribution of economic opportunities uh, across cities as well. To pick up the point about population growth, and I think the phrase anemic population growth was used by Tim uh, earlier today is uh, it's true. Uh, Newcastle's uh, population growth has been relatively moderate for a number of years, and the projections are also quite moderate. Um, there has been a change, and uh, I want to unpack this in two ways. Firstly, a change that's happened pre-COVID as well. And in the four years prior to uh, COVID starting last year, we saw year-on-year -year increases in the net migration of people from Greater Sydney to Newcastle and led to over uh, almost a doubling from 2016-17 uh, to 2019-20. I knew so it. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, and obviously, uh, the data is not out yet to capture what has been the changes and the impacts um, since COVID. Uh, we only have data through to 30 June last year. The data for this year comes out early next year. But proxy data, rental vacancies, housing market really demonstrates and, and can articulate that people are making decisions with their feet. I actually think a, a nuance of this conversation that's been missed so far has been this con uh, national conversation about moving from the city to the bush or moving from the city to the regions. And I really want to articulate that 
we view Newcastle as being a connector between both metropolitan and regional. And I think the two-part dichotomy of metro region uh, really does a disservice to the role that places like Newcastle, Wollongong, Geelong, other places across the country play from both a population and an, uh, an economic growth point of view. Um, as I said before, uh, we've, uh, we've partnered with Wollongong and Geelong to create a new alliance called the Gateway Cities Alliance. Uh, it's uh, formed uh, just over 18 months ago now, focused around uh, advocacy, focused around uh, firstly, an initial research report that articulated our similarities and opportunities and also looked at best practice examples of mid-sized cities uh, across Europe and across North America as well. There's lots of learnings uh, and uh, applications for our cities in that space as well. I really feel that that alliance has the potential to both connect into the metropolitan planning that we're talking about today, but also more broadly nationally about the role that mid-sized cities can play in this post-COVID world as well. And I suppose a question that I want to leave for, for the panellists, uh, for the provocateurs and for the audience as well is, uh, we have a plan for growing uh, for three cities in Sydney. We're talking today about a plan for five cities in Sydney, which connects Newcastle and Wollongong. Is there a need for a plan for 10 cities across New South Wales or 20 cities across Australia as well? And this comes in the light of thinking about, we're talking about New South Wales with over 10 million population by 2040. And that's even uh, with the, the slowing population that we've seen uh, in COVID. Obviously, federal government's announced increases to permanent mi migration intake over the coming years this week as well. There's a, uh, uh, there's a challenge there about how do we best plan for that uh, population growth and also in light of the economic opportunities as well. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, a really great perspective, not only a, um, a Newcastle perspective, but a demographic perspective, which I think is really interesting. We have three provocateurs. Uh, Professor Roberta Ryan uh, is uh, with us. I've got way too many documents open here. I'm so excited listening to you all. Uh, um, Professor uh, Ryan is at the University of Newcastle. She holds the chair in local government, and she's also the Western Sydney Metropolis Independent Community Commissioner as well as the director of the Hunter Research Foundation Centre. Roderick Simpson is our other new voice uh, for our last half hour. Uh, he's an architect, director of Simpson and Wilson Architects. He was the inaugural Environment Commissioner of the Greater Sydney Commission. Uh, and Dr. Tim Williams has stayed on to be our third provocateur for the afternoon. Maybe we start with you, Roberta, and can I refer you to a couple of questions that have come through? Um, John Engler from Shelter New South Wales asks, interested to hear from the panel about why Sydney is 10 times the size of Newcastle. <clears throat> is it time to start thinking about a state with 10 cities, which is pretty much what Simon was just saying to us. And um, secondly, this question around housing. State governments renewing large social housing estates and building innovative smaller density sites across the city, but the percentage of housing stock is not kept up with population growth, let alone demand. What role for councils in advocating uh, for that. So maybe you take that comment and add some provocative thoughts of your own back to the panel. Well, thanks very much. Um, and it's great to be with everyone. Um, look, I think one of the key questions, and it's reflected in, in that challenge that's been put to us all, is this notion of spatial inequality. It's, it's my area of interest. And, um, you know, what determines one's life chances these days is, is our postcode. Um, now, that's, that's a pretty parlous situation that we find ourselves in. It's not just about housing, uh, although housing and access to good services are critical in that. So the, the, the sort of challenge we're all grappling with here, I think, is, is what do we do if we don't plan for growth and if we don't do something that's really focused on, you know, this spatial element? Um, and the work of the Greater Sydney Commission, of course, and others has been really trying to grab hold of this. But... When, when we think about this notion that it's our postcode that is the strongest indicator of our, ourselves and our family's life chances, the, the question that I want to put to people is, why don't we have a local government as a stronger voice in this? Now, you know, everyone might groan and say, well, you'd expect that from a professor of local government. I'm a professor of local government because I believe that uh, the, the best way for communities to have a voice to influence what happens has to come from the spatial, the only spatial level of government, which is local government. 
and continually, and I'm sure um, our local government colleagues on this all will um, reflect this, is that actually the reality is the powers of local government have been increasingly diminished over time. And, uh, you know, my yeah. work in the Eritropolis, um, one of the things that's really startling to me is not is not dealing with a distressed community that's facing that incredible change. That is, of course, challenging. The most difficult thing I do every day, and um, I'm sure this is reflected in uh, the work of most people in councils, is, co is this issue of uh, agency coordination. And I hear every day in the Eritropolis, as I'm sure people in local government do, the government is doing this stuff to us. Nobody knows who the government is. Uh, people know who their councils are, this line, of site, this the, the biggest challenge I have is this intergovernmental coordination piece because we really struggle to get a place focus. So when we when we line up this problem that we have around spatial inequality, of which housing is an element, when we line up this incredible kind of complex change that we're trying to get our heads around, local government should be driving this. It's right. local government voices uh, right. that enable the community and shape these places, community shape places. And it's local government that provide us access to that. So I want to know my question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, local government can address the housing affordability issue uh, with the right levers. Local government can enable places where people want to live. So I, I want to know how we can get local government a stronger voice in this. Let's hear from the panel on that. Start with Adam Zarf. Adam, if you just unmute and have a go at that. Yeah, look, we've been tossing around the idea of housing affordability because we represent businesses here in the Illawarra that cannot find low-paid staff to work in those sorts of industries, hospitality, retail, and the like. Uh, I think that's really interesting to hear Professor Ryan say that because we're, I've just been casting around a little bit at overseas models and I won't, I won't elaborate on them now because I'd just be sort of, I guess, uh, throwing ideas around. But in Europe, um, I think in Germany, they have a model where once a, uh, a council uh, has agreed a certain model of development, uh, if, it, if it conforms, it proceeds. Uh, very interesting. That will be really popular with the community, I imagine. Uh, so look, I think we're going to take a good look at that in 2022 as, as a business movement. Uh, I know that David's particularly interested, interested in that too, and obviously I wouldn't speak for, for him, but um, in our region, it's acute, that challenge. I'd probably just leave it there and just say that those sorts of options like those elevated by Professor Ryan are really interesting to us. Yeah, and if I can turn to David, it's this really interesting point, isn't it? Because at the heart of what we're talking about is resilience. Uh, as well as infrastructure and all those other things, is resilience, how to recover post-pandemic. So we've got, we've got all this money flying around that we can direct into this recovery and what we know absolutely well and truly about the social determinants of health, um, about your life chances, as Roberta said, is that housing, as an example, um, and location of where you live makes people vulnerable. Poverty makes people vulnerable. And really that, that social housing and addressing inequality needs to be at the heart of planning for the next pandemic, not because it's the, just because it's the right thing to do, but actually because um, that's what's going to make us resilient the next time around. Now, from the Western Sydney point of view, when you overlay climate change on top of that, to what extent do you start to blur those lines between what's economic and infrastructure and social in terms of what you need to develop going forward? Yeah, look, great question. Uh, I, I mean, I think that there's a, there's a if, you, if you look, if you, if you were sitting around most company boards at the moment, they're, they're all fascinated with this area of ESG, environment, sustainability and governance. So I think we are, blur, companies are blurring the lines between what's purely bottom line and what they need to do as part of a sort of social remit. And I think governments are ex exactly in that space as well. Um, I think, do, do you mind if, Ellen, I just, the, the earlier point you had was about, you know, to that question of um, Professor Ryan's around how can we get local government yeah. to play a bigger role in our governments? I, I honestly think that um, we, we do need more grown up local government. Like, I, th I think we need le leaders that are empowered, in particular mayors, uh, that, that are empowered more to, to do more than just chair you know meetings i'm sure that's not the case with many mayors but like we i, th I think the system is not really you know de designed to, to 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 generate you know great leadership at a local government level and i think that needs to change i don't know how, how you change that i suspect um you know having different mayors all the time that doesn't help um maybe giving them some more powers not not absolute power but you know the strong mayor models in in u.s cities really do allow a mayor to go to an election to have a platform to be elected and to have a mandate um, to, to sort of d d deliver that. So I think, you know, 
Um, hey, you have to make your councillors and your mayors full time. And yes, you have 100%. to remunerate them properly. Pay them. Yeah. And you have to give them a full time job. And that way the leadership will become better. The quality of the leadership will become better because they're not torn between their day job and then their mayoral activities. 100%. Gail. I, know, I know a mayor at the moment in Sydney uh, who's got a really senior job uh, running a government agency, actually. Uh, who just sort of, you know, for them, it's not, they're only doing it short term. They can't do it long term because they can't afford to. So um, mm -hmm. you've got someone who's got some good, great skills who just can't bring them to bear. So I think we've got to, we've got to reform. And unfortunately, the local government um, reform or amalgamations was probably the, the most botched reform that the, 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 the current government has, has actually un undertaken. It just was a disaster from start, start to finish. And, and the tragedy is that there were some really noble things in there that could have been done. But I think the delivery, the execution was so badly done, which probably means as a community, we're not going to look at it for a long time, which I think is really sad. Let, let me um, draw Sorry, in. Sorry, Ellen, just going back to what uh, yeah. Roberta said, having worked in Queensland local government and the size of the councils up there, they have a much stronger leadership position. Sure. They are more powerful because they are full-time mayors and councillors. Uh, they treat it like a, a full-time uh, qualified professional role. And they have a much better interaction with state government and they can drive policy and they can drive direction because of that strength that they have. Yeah. Uh, so you don't have as much of that comp competition between state government policy and local leaders uh, where there's you know, a, a little bit of um, you know, tit for tattle politics. Um, you don't have imposition of housing targets and you must achieve it and things like yes, that and, yes. and arguments yeah. about supply and the nature of housing and you know, so, where you've got a strong council and a strong governing body that's working with state government, um, you get the better results. And okay. I, we, I, are, I'm we are short on time, well, so yeah. I just do want to draw in um, Roderick Simpson, if I can. You've been listening patiently. What are your um, provocative thoughts for our panel? Um, I'll ask you to keep them quite brief because I really want to hear from, um, from Simon in our next go-round. Um, okay, well, very, very briefly then. I suppose what occurs to me is, you know, the topic is the five cities. Um, look, I think the three cities models have been very effective as a symbolic, um, if you like, a graphic representation of a policy intention to refocus on the West. And I think it's been very successful that way. But as Gail said, you know, we've had strategies in the past with four cities, six cities. Uh, and for that matter, before that, we had the strategic centres of which there's about 21, 22, 23, depending how you define them. Uh, and of course, there's about 1300 centres. So the point I would make is I think we've moved beyond the time we need plans. We don't need any more plans. What we need is a strategic framework that allows us to have a lot of plans, plan A, plan B, plan C, literally, ready to go when something happens we haven't anticipated. Yeah, yeah. Now, when you look at some of the major infrastructure decisions that we continue to make, they are actually all founded on the idea of business as usual, that the world is going to continue pretty much the way it's been going for the last 20 years. And my goodness, what a wake up call COVID has been. Because if we think about it, if we just delayed the spend, for example, this is where I'm being provocative, if we delayed the spend on roads over the next few years and redirected it to things such as social infrastructure, or for that matter, dare I say it, the beginnings of River Rail, which might in fact extend up and link to Macquarie, which would create a great rail ring, just as the Yamanote line does in Japan. If we did something like that, ready to go, understanding that some of these things take time, it might mean that we reprioritize. So I don't see the challenges having a, a better plan. We've had millions of plans. We've actually got the intelligence embedded in those plans and we can go right back to the County of Cumberland plan. And guess what? It mapped the 30 minute city. It mapped the strategic centers. Mm. It said we needed jobs closer to homes. Mm. I mean, these things, there's nothing new about this. Of course, and the point I'd make is why have we got the expressways we've got today? Well, because they were drawn in the 1930s, right? So you've still got to draw the line. So good on George's River Council for drawing river rail because those things i'm not being flippant here it's very important to draw the lines and then think what is the time that we need to do this and to have them ready to go so 
Okay. I guess this goes to what I the, the challenge back to um, the panel, I suppose, is um, how do we evaluate these projects? Because the way we've evaluated things in the past has been really pretty narrowly focused on economic development and productivity, which is founded on the idea, yes, it'll, all this stuff will magically filter down through trickle down effective economics and address all these problems. Even, even the Western city, the third city, is still founded fundamentally on that premise that you know, by putting in big infrastructure and attracting big business that somehow over time, the citizens of Western Sydney will benefit and these inequalities and inefficiencies will be addressed. Okay. And I think we've reached a time now where we say, no, actually we need to, re we need to have different ways of evaluating these projects because it's about the human values, which is, of course is all bound up in resilience. If we're talking about resilience, We've got to recognise, as we did during COVID, that it's about the resilience of local communities and their access to services that's actually far more important than the supposed long-term productivity benefits. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm going to I'm going to pull yeah, you up there, Simon and um, sorry, Roderick, and go to Simon on that one. I think that's really um, bang on, very provocative. Forget about the plans. Get a better evaluation tool yeah. based on resilience. That's it. Thanks, Rod, and thanks, Ellen. Uh, really interesting uh, discussion and, and thought-provoking questions. City of Newcastle uh, recently pulled together a new economic development strategy and used a new local framework, um, which is built off donut economics uh, yeah. from Kate uh, Ravensworth. And it's a really great way of balancing evaluation, as you say, Rod, about incorporating the economic components, the social components, and the environmental components collectively to provide uh, a vision, which can therefore be used for evaluations on infrastructure, hard infrastructure, soft infrastructure, and a, and a range of different programs that local governments can lead. It's been a really uh, valuable process for us in terms of re reframing our thinking about how we've approached this. Um, I might leave it at that. Thanks, Ellen. Okay. Um, maybe, um, Adam, have you got any thoughts on that one? Yeah, look, I'd, I'd probably just, I think, defer to what Simon said, we have similar ambitions in Wollongong and uh, as part of that Gateways Cities piece, uh, you know, and I think the assessment frameworks uh, being used do need a change. I just generally concur with that and, and, and I agree with Roderick on that basis. Mm. Um, yeah, who is next? Oh, sorry, uh, being Williams, I'm always alphabetically last. So I'm-, I'm <laughs> Sorry about that. And I, think, and I think I deserve it as well. Shall I, can I say something? Indeed. Uh, it's not a provocation because, of course, that's not me. No. So um, I, w what I was going to say was, I think we're living in a remarkable time where, where we, it's one of those, the, the best metaphor is of the, the, the guy who's gone in for an operation to remove his leg and, he, and years later he still thinks he can feel his toes, you know. It's kind of, uh, it's, it's a radical moment. We still don't really understand exactly what it all means. And there's so many things floating around. So, for example, we, we hear about housing affordability Slightly unexpectedly, with no population rise in Sydney in the year of COVID, house prices have gone up 15 to 20 percent with no population increase whatsoever. How did that happen? Do we really understand where house price inflation comes from? So I think there, I think there's a really, you know, there's some really important sort of ground setting moments. Rod, Rod's point about planning. When I first came to Sydney, the first thing that I learned was him telling me which I thought was brilliant then and is still brilliant, that, uh, that uh, essentially planning was a form of kabuki in Sydney, that the, uh, it's, it's all ritualistic, it takes place on stage, but it's not the real thing, right? Yeah. So I think, I, think we, we, I think what I'm getting at is that the, there's a moment in time where a kind of radicalism is now absolutely necessary, you know, to understand that the world has changed profoundly. Now, I am a bit in dispute with, with fellow people who think that um, uh, we can have all the benefits of wealth, but not through generating it, you know, I, 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 I think there is an issue around, I'm still a bit of an old progressive who thinks that you have to create wealth and then distribute it. There's nothing more easy to trickle down than poverty, believe me. So, you know, uh, so I, I'm sort of still not sure about these things. O on governance uh, and then, and then the, the access that we're talking about today. Um, so on the access first, I think what it, we mustn't lose sight of the proposition uh, and whether or not you think the 2005 plan was better than the 2016-17 Greatest Sydney Commission plan, 
essentially uh, we, we need to understand the opportunities and needs of all axes of Sydney and to understand the city region in its wider sense and to, uh, in broad sense, plan for it, i.e. Uh, to try and work out what we want and then work out exactly what will deliver it. But I think we need to think and try and get the Greater Sydney Commission and DPI to think again about that axis. I don't want to lose any sight from that, that discussion, I think. And then the transport fundamentals of that. There are real opportunities, come back to Dave's, Dave Borger's point, and again, I think Dave is in danger of reading stuff that I have written, but didn't bring to today to the party, which is uh, that I, I, uh, I think the 70% city is what we're going to go back to, but that's not the 100% city. That isn't the city of complete agglomeration before. There will be a more decentralised economy, and therefore we have to work out how we make that work best in New South Wales terms. And I like what, um, I can't remember if it was uh, Simon or, or whether it was Newcastle or uh, the Illawarra, but the idea that we need to understand uh, not just the connectivity between Wollongong and Sydney, but what Wollongong does in its sub-region uh, and what Newcastle does in its sub-region. And, and so, so I think this is a rather splenetic round by me, but I'm basically saying I think there's an opportunity where there's the transvaluation of all values going on. We really don't actually quite understand some of the things going on at the moment. That actually perversely is an opportunity to think from first principles a bit. I think that when the GSC does its new plan, it should be even more into this radicalism that, that COVID is, has implied than I think it is uh, on pathway to be at the moment. And the city region discussion is a huge part of where we go next, as long as we also understand it is about the nearby hood, the hyper local, and it's interplay with, you know, CBDs and all this kind of stuff. So I'm sort of strangely, weirdly excited by all this stuff because I think it actually gets us away from some of the path dependency that actually hasn't been very good uh, and, and and we were locked into all that the last thing I was going to say was about governance the I'm a bit of a radical democrat there's there is a democratic deficit at the heart of metropolitan uh, planning I've always you know when we helped create and support the JSC I always thought the next stage would be a greater London style democratization of our metropolis. Uh, if people think we've got a lack of integration between various government departments and all, it's because it's not a democratically run entity in which the mayor says land use and transport integration, otherwise I sack you. So I, I think there's a, a kind of need for a, a governance discussion. But look, it's a great moment. And, and don't you think it's great that the councils are having this discussion and that we're all here because of them? I think it's a great moment. Who would like to respond? Um... To that, I think that's a it's a really interesting point, and there's a there's another point that's that's perhaps even more cut through that our Wollongong and and Newcastle panelists Adam and Simon might like to look at it is um, does any of this matter a fig if you don't build the rail, fast rail between those two areas to just join it all up? Are we overthinking this? Um, who wants to start? Uh, Ellen, I might just jump in if that's okay. And Tim, Tim raised a lot of points, and I'd love to pick up on maybe just two of them. Um, as you said, Tim, Wollongong and Newcastle, and sorry to speak for your region, Simon, service uh, their hinterland, sure. So we have our own regions that we that we service as capital cities, but we also offer opportunities uh, for Sydney. And Tim, you picked that yeah. up at the start of your presentation. Yeah. Wollongong and the Illawarra really want to play its role, uh, as no doubt Newcastle and the Hunter do, in really servicing the growth uh, projections that we're seeing from Sydney. And of course, that includes um, industry and freight. And we have, uh, you know, deep water port of Port Kembla, uh, which is, you know, obviously going to be a spillover port uh, for uh, for Sydney. As and it already services a significant amount of work, like every single vehicle that enters New South Wales comes in via Port Kembla. So we're just making sure that we uh, have plans for the future to ensure that we're properly linked to Sydney. And we have a really challenging topography in the Illawarra. We have an almighty 350 metre high escarpment that makes infrastructure development particularly expensive, challenging and the rest. So I guess these are the things that we're wrestling with, but I guess we always want to be highlighted in that opportunity for Greater Sydney. And that's where I think it comes back to the three, the three cities uh, conurbation argument. Mm. And one additional point to add is a lot of the fast rail conversation talks about accessing uh, the skills and the people in Newcastle and Wollongong to service uh, businesses and enterprises operating in the Sydney metropolitan region. There's a really strong argument and value the other way as well about businesses accessing the um, global gateways, the regional gateways that both of our cities have and potentially cheaper commercial um, space to access as well. And there's a, a broad conversation on the relationship both ways. 
Mm. Uh, quick final comments, if I can, from, from Gail and from David, starting with Gail. Thanks, Ellen. Uh, I think Adam and, and Simon, you're right. Uh, we can't just think about uh, the regions on their own. It has to be connections. It has to be about placemaking. I think the, the role of the councils will become more and more important. Um, I still go back to what I said originally. If the state government builds it, we will come. The councils will come. We will surround your infrastructure. We will make places. We will make it into superbia. Uh, we will do all of the hard yards because we're bloody good at it. Um, and all it takes is that leadership and that partnership with state government oh. to have that thought, to bring the infrastructure. We can do the rest. We're well equipped and councils have been doing it for centuries and we'll continue to do it into the future. So please, you know, don't discount the role that local government is going to play in the future in reimagining and reshaping how all of our cities work and the regions. Hmm. Final thoughts, David? Yeah, look, I, I mean, I think to some extent we've come full circle from when Michael Caton, who was an actor in the castle, stood on the beach, on Bondi Beach opposing a railway line coming to Bondi to communities that are actually getting behind projects. And we had an example of that with Western Sydney Airport where governments were scared, they didn't want to do it. Communities came together, business uh, councils of different political persuasions and showed governments that the community had moved on and we actually wanted the jobs. So I actually think what uh, George's River is doing is excellent and I think that there's a big role for, you know, broad advocacy campaigns to get behind, uh, you know, Cross River Rail and, 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 and to get this done. So I think that, you know, this is just the beginning of a conversation. We're really happy to support that. Mm. And I love that theme that's coming through at the end there uh, from Tim, from David, uh, about the notion of participate. Don't be um, demoralised. Uh, by ICAC and all the rest of it. Participate, participate. This is, uh, uh, be a radical Democrat. I think that's terrific. And the role of local government, if you build it, they will come, I think is fascinating. And, um, and uh, wonderful to have included both Adam and Simon in that conversation and that wonderful example that everybody kept bringing up of Vancouver. What was it all the way down to Seattle and so forth? Um, and you can just see that, that that is the future and how do we do that in a way that's equitable, that's resilient, uh, that's ready for the next pandemic and that's livable. So please, a big thanks to all our um, panellists and to our provocateurs. That was um, all we hoped for. And thank you so much for all those questions coming through. Some fantastic questions. We'll screenshot those and perhaps find a way to, to feed those um, back. Um, to everyone. Uh, it is now time uh, to hear from uh, the Mayor of, uh, uh, let me find my notes, I'm sorry I got all excited, closed proceedings, the Mayor of Wollongong, uh, Lord Mayor Gordon Bradbury AM. Let's hear his taped remarks. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you to Mayor Kevin Green and Georges River Council for hosting today's event. Look, I'm very sorry that I've been unable to participate. I just want to remind you that there are significant interactions between Wollongong and the Southern Sydney LGAs, and it's important to share ideas on the future growth of our regions and their interconnectivity. As you may have heard today, the Gateway City Alliance which consists of Newcastle, Wollongong and Geelong councils, presented to federal government MPs and policy makers last week on the roles of these cities in particular as in the post-COVID environment. Wollongong, like other gateway cities, has a large and diverse population. It's got critical assets and infrastructure such as Port Kembla and the associated heavy industry and logistics connectivity with the state capital, that is Wollongong through to Sydney, and a history of significant contribution to national region and growth, often as a site for manufacturing and heavy industry, as we all know, with blow scope and the steel industry. A diverse economic and industrial base demonstrates the capacity for economic transformation, which is very much a theme of this city of ours first-class health and educational opportunities, such as the University of Wollongong. So with the right planning and investment, these cities can provide substantial opportunity in the future, defraying pressures on neighbouring metropolitan areas and contributing to the nation's growth. And Wollongong has a number of advantages, including its great lifestyle, superb livability, 
and large pool of highly skilled employees, especially the graduates from university and TAFE. So prior to the pandemic, there were around about 25,000 people leaving Wollongong each day to travel to Sydney for work. This is unlikely to continue post-COVID as companies and employees change their working habits and people decide to work closer to where they live. Council's economic development strategy has a strong focus on local job creation. Wollongong CBD is undergoing a rapid transformation with a number of cranes on the skyline and several large office developments either under construction or in the pipeline. There is approximately 28,000 square metres of A-grade office space under construction or newly completed, making it an alternative CBD location of choice. So thank you again for convening this event. Wollongong City Council looks forward to working closely with our neighbouring local government areas, not only to the north, that is towards Sydney, but also to the west. And uh, this is the future that we can all work together for our mutual benefit. Thank you so much. What a wonderful conclusion to today's events from Lord Mayor Gordon Bradbury in the wonderful city of Wollongong. Um, I thank so much to the organisers for offering me the opportunity to participate in this wonderful discussion today. It seems we have all, as I said earlier, very much lived in the present for the past 18 months, stuck in sort of the suspended animation of the pandemic. It's been the politics of right now, and it's been hard to imagine uh, the future. But while we were riding out the pandemic with our wonderful essential workers still keeping all our cities going, our knowledge workers figuring out how they could do it from home or closer to home, we were actually challenging the where and the how of how we live in this region. And I hope today's events has provided you with some brainstorming, some intellectual challenge about the exciting task ahead. Thank you so much, all of you, for your participation and good afternoon to you all.